just a moment. Romans chapter 7. And continue our discussion in the uh, first half of uh, the book of Romans here in just a second. Before we get into chapter 7, we do want to remind ourselves of the outline of the following and the theme of the book. And then we will uh, get into chapter 7. The book of Romans, as we have as a whole, the theme that we've been discussing is the book of Romans has is that the righteous shall live by faith, or the just, depending on your depending on your translation. And so our outline reflects itself, particularly in the first section. As the book divides down into uh, two major sections, we've got the justification by faith through grace in one through eleven, and then twelve through sixteen is the application section or living as a Christian. Because you've been justified by faith through grace, here's how you need, how you need to live. That, that first section, where we still are, lies in the three subcategories. We've already discussed the first one, that is the need for justification, and then we're on the second, on justification is available to all. We've been discussing this, but we've got a chart here we will look at for it. And that is the chapter content of the book of Romans. We've been reminding ourselves of what each of these chapters is about. And uh, so I'll put a slide in here uh, for it this, at this evening so we can look at the slide over what each chapter is about as a reminder as we sort of uh, weave these chapters together and see how they fit in the broader picture of the book of Romans. That first three chapters in this first subsection on the outline on the need for justification tells us that there's a need because the Gentiles, the Jews, and all need the gospel. And the reason all need it is because the Gentiles sin, the Jews sin, and thus all have sinned, fall short of the glory of God. So that's the theme throughout the first three chapters. As we pointed out, and you probably heard before, Romans 1 plus Romans 2 equals Romans 3. The Gentiles sin, and then the Jews sin. Or, we can think of it this way, if all Jews and all non-Jews sin, then everybody can sin, and so thus all the, the gospel. Chapter 4 is about faith as accounted for righteousness. It talks about Abraham, the example of him. And how his faith was accounted to him for righteousness. And uh, how that can be shown for us today, that we can be justified by faith. In chapter 5, then, he talks about the blessings of justification. This is in the subsection on that this justification is available to everyone. And so in chapter 5, as you talk about at the end of 4, it's available to everyone. Chapter 5, if you then have been justified, here's the blessings. So as he's writing to those who are Christians, since we have been justified by faith, and he goes on to talk about the blessings that we have, how we have uh, access, we have peace with God, and we have access to the grace of God, and how we have hope. And so that's uh, what the first 11 verses in the chapter 5 are about before there's a comparison and contrast with Adam and Christ at the end of the chapter. At the end of chapter 5, he makes a statement in wrapping up his discussion on Adam and Christ that where sin abounds, grace abounds much more or all the more. Which led to a series of questions in chapter 6, two questions in particular. The first question was, can we continue in sin that grace may abound? And the second was, can we sin, shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? And so what chapter 6 is, is about do not continue in sin. You can think about it this way. Chapter 6 could be titled, Grace is not a license to sin. And so he points out how they died to sin, and how not let sin reign in their bodies, and that you are slaves of whom you obey. And there is no fruit in sin. Those are really the four things he points out uh, to answer the argument of those two questions. And so he answered those in chapter 6. Chapter 7 now continues the section on the justification available to all. And he's going to be discussing the law and sin. So we're discussing here in chapter 7 the old law. And we'll get evidence of that as we move throughout the text more in chapter 7 this evening and show that it is the old law under, under consideration. But before we get uh, to that part of the discussion, we want to begin with this point that he makes in 1 through 6, and that is we are dead to the law. In verses 1 through 6, he's going to point out that we are dead to the law, and he's going to begin by using an illustration. And then he's going to explain that we're dead to the law through Christ in 4 through 6. But let's begin with this illustration of marriage. 
And so beginning at verse 1, he says, Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law, and if she marries another, she is not an adulteress. And so, this is a passage that uh, in Romans 7 we we'll often talk about with uh, marriage and divorce, and while that is not the main point of chapter 7, the main point is about the law, and we'll get to that in a moment, there are some things we want to understand and point out from Romans chapter 7. Uh, when I was in Tennessee a couple of years ago, working with Donnie Rader, he told me that he was told by a preacher when he first started out, and when he was doing some writing, and perhaps you've seen, he's, he's written some material over divorce and marriage. Now, while he was talking to some preachers, one of them told him, when he asked him about what would you say to help understand the issues of divorce and marriage, he was told by an older preacher to understand Romans 7 and the marriage and the bond. And if you understand that, it helps answer a lot of questions. And so we'll look at that here in a second and see what, uh, exactly what all was said. But Romans chapter 7 is a critical passage in understanding some issues on divorce and marriage. So while it's not the main point of the text, it's an illustration being raised, we do want to point out a couple of things here. Now, they said we're not going to go into any great detail on any of this on the marriage of the Bible this evening. Uh, and our purpose is in studying the book of Romans. If you do want to find more, a little more in-depth study of that, we did one uh, in a series of lessons on the board sometime last year. It's online to find our podcast on our YouTube. So there, there's more detail there if you have more questions uh, that that might help explain. But we're going to give you sort of the basic rundown of Romans chapter 7 in this section in one through three this evening. As we illustrate this section here, we've got uh, two people that are married here at the bottom of the, the page. And what we need to understand is that what they are married is they are bound by the law. So what often happens is we see simply this picture here. Two individuals that are married. And so in society, the two individuals are married, the socials are married, they can't marry anybody else. And According to society nowadays, they can get a divorce for whatever reason they so please, and then they can marry another. And we know that's not in the Matthew chapter 19 and verse 9. But something that has to be understood and that is often confused, particularly to those who teach error on the virgin of marriage, is that the marriage and the bond are not the same thing, they are different. So what often happens is that people confuse the marriage and the bond. What needs to be understood is these two individuals are married, but they are bound to one another by God's law. God's law is one man, one woman, for life. That is God's law. And they are bound to one another by that. Well, what happens oftentimes is that there is some confusion that people think that marriage and the body are the same. If you sever one, you sever the other. But look at Romans chapter 7 again and what is said. This is why it's important in our understanding of uh, uh, issues concerning divorce and remarriage. It says here in the text, uh, verse 2, For a woman, a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. So how long is she bound to him? How long does it say she's bound? As long as he lives. As long as he lives. If her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. That is, if, she, if he dies, she is no longer bound to him. Verse 3 then. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. Now let's back up here to verse 2. How long are they bound? For life. She's married to another man, but her first husband, the man to whom she is, the man to whom she is bound, why? He's still living. She's bound to him, this, this first husband, even though she is married to a second man. You see that in, in verse 2 and 3? She's bound to her husband as long as he lives. According to she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man or is married to another man while her husband is alive. Now if he's alive, according to verse 2, he's bound. So she may be married to somebody else, but she's bound to the first husband. Bound by God's law. You see, that's what Romans chapter 7 and verse 2 would point out. They're bound as long as they live. 
Now, we know the exception to Matthew 19 and verse 9, and that if he was guilty of fornication, she would be free to divorce him and to remarry for Matthew 19, 9 and Matthew chapter 5. But we're not interested in the exception right now this evening. We're trying to understand the rule of Romans 7. It helps us in understanding. Uh, the rule is that they are bound for life. Interesting enough, Romans chapter 7 and in verse 3 is the only New Testament passage that tells us why a subsequent marriage is adultery. Think about that for a second. We have in Matthew 19, 9, Matthew 5, and these other passages that if somebody gets an unscriptural divorce and remarries, they are guilty of adultery. I didn't know Matthew 19 would tell us in Matthew 5 and other passages as well. But Romans, it just simply tells us the fact. Romans chapter 7 explains to us why that is. Why is it that she shall be called an adulteress? Because she's still bound to that first husband. So they get an unscriptural divorce. For the illustration before, maybe they get a divorce because she worked the this case. Or he forgot to call them and only for work one night. You could throw in any reason you want outside of fornication. And they got divorced for whatever reason. But they were bound to one another by God's law. So when they divorce, there may no longer be a marriage in the eyes of the law of the land, but they are bound. Which means if either one of them remarries, they are guilty of adultery. It explains to us why that is, because there's a bond that exists. So here's how Romans 7 is a key uh, passage. Uh, before we move on here from Romans 7, here's why Romans 7 is so important. When somebody asks a question about whether a marriage is scriptural or not, the question that has to be asked is, is there a previous bond? Right? They're bound by, by God's law to one another. If they are bound to somebody else, then a subsequent marriage would be adultery. If they are not bound to somebody else, then they're free to marry. So that's how Romans chapter 7 helps us in understanding that question. So the question is, does a bond exist? Are they bound to somebody? That's what Romans 7 helps us because it tells us why a subsequent marriage is adultery. Verse 3 now. Again, I want to notice an interesting phrase here. Not an interesting phrase, a, a word here. Uh, accordingly, she, sh she will be called, verse 3, an adulteress. That word called is a word that means called by God. If you go throughout the scriptures and the way that this word rendered called is used, uh, it is used of, of God. Uh, let's just give a couple of, of examples here. Either it's directly from God or it's called by a, a, an angel or something that's being a, a messenger for God. Matthew 2 verse 12. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they depart from the country by another way. So here were those wise men that came, they were warned. Well, who warned them? God warned them. When he heard, verse 22 of Matthew 2, that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there, and being warned, who warned Joseph not to go back to the area of Judea? It was God. Luke 2, 26, and had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit, that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord Jesus Christ. Revealed by the Holy Spirit, revealed by God. Uh, Acts 10, 22, Cornelius, is hearing an upright and god fearing man, who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel. Since it was directed by the holy angel, the angel spoke on behalf of who? God. Uh, by the way, Acts 11, 26, disciples were first called Christians, same order, called by God. Hebrews 8, 5, they serve as a copy in the shadow of the heavenly things, for when Moses was uh, about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God. Hebrews 11, 7, being warned by God. No, but being warned by God. And Hebrews 12, 25, see that you do not refuse him who is speaking, for if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less when they escaped through rejecting the words from heaven. And it's talking about the message that was being preached by those. So it's in these occasions, as it talks about being warned or instructed or called, it was called by God. So that's how it's used in the eight occasions throughout the scripture other than Romans 7. So when you come to Romans 7 and verse 3, it gives us the same Greek word. She was 
call shall be called an adulteress. That's not called by man. In fact, in today's society, she would not be called an adulteress. But rather, she is called an adulteress by God. Which shows us uh, the seriousness here that it's God who's referring to that, not man's uh, thoughts or ideas, but it is called by God. So, uh, that's uh, something important to understand as well, is it's not just man's thoughts of what she is called, it's God calling her an adulteress. Now, we're going to spend a little bit of time on Romans 7 and the marriage of the Bible, and explaining the, the distinction between the two, that if she's bound to the first husband, that she's married to another. But let's understand for a second why it is he brings this up in this passage. The point he's driving home, verse 1, is that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. And so what he's pointing out, he uses the illustration, and what he's going to point out in 4 through 6, is that they're dead to the law, the old law, through crimes. So that law no longer has dominion over them. Instead, they are under the new law or the new covenant. So, look at verse 4 again. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are enslaved, or we are released from the law, having died in that which held us captive, so that we, uh, that we serve in the new way of the Spirit, and not in the old way of the written code, or code, or of the letter. So we point out here, in, in, in verses uh, 4 through 6, is that uh, we've, uh, that old law, God is that old law through Christ, that old law is done away. So think about the illustration of marriage for a second. It brings us up. It was as if they were married to that old law, right? But now, through Christ, they are dead to the law. That law is no more. That old law is taken out of the way. Now they are under the new law. Just like when the woman's husband dies, she is released from that bond and she can marry another. And so what he's pointing out to them here, why he brought up the marriage relationship, was to point out that they have died to the old law, and that law that once had dominion over them is no longer has dominion over them. Instead, they're under this new law. Not in the way of the written code, but in the new way of the Spirit. Some terminology that Lord willing later on when we get to 1 Corinthians, uh, we'll see, or uh, rather 2 Corinthians, we'll see some of that kind of terminology used to the law in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3. Uh, we did a study on that at some time back in the superiority of the New Covenant, but that that old law was taken away. It wasn't the written code of the old law, but rather it's this new law in the way of the Spirit. It's that uh, that was being preached to them now. It's not the same as that old of the old letter. So that that law is out of the way and now under this new law, the law they're being taught. That law, as we saw previously, is the law of faith. So you recall in chapter six, uh, we are not under uh, shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace, and we pointed out that he wasn't saying we're not under any law, but we're, that we're not under law at all, but we're just not under any regular law. It's God's law that we're under the law, and according to chapter 3, it's called the law of faith. And so he's pointed out that they're dead to the old law, uh, that law of the written code, uh, that they may serve in the new way of the Spirit and in that new law. Now, that leads to section 2, which is going to be another question. He said in verse 6, For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for that. And so, uh, what he's pointing out here is that uh, because of the law, it aroused the, uh, the, the sinful passions were aroused by the law leading to death, which then leads to this question. What shall we say then? That the law is sin? So here's another question that he's going to answer. Again, before, uh, one thing Paul does a lot of times in his writing is to make a statement. And before somebody can try to take a twist and misuse, I'm still trying to take a twist and misuse. 
But he's going to go ahead and answer our constant argument of grace for him. Again, think back to chapter 5. In chapter 5, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Then he comes to chapter 6, and it's almost like Paul says, Now wait a minute, don't think I was saying that great, the grace of God is a license for you to sin. You cannot continue in sin because you died to it and you're not to let it reign in you. We're not under law, but under grace. Now, but then he goes, now wait a minute again. Don't think that means you can continue in sin. Because your slaves of whom you obey, and the life of sin had no fruit. So in chapter 7 here again, he points out that it was the law that aroused the sinful passions. And so, uh, then he's going to answer a question. So I'm going, wait a minute. Are you saying the old law was sin and sinful? And what he says in verse 7 is no. But the law did was it taught what sin is. Verse 7. What then shall we say that the law is sin? By no means, yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin, for I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had said you shall not covet. What Paul is saying is that it, the... Uh, the law aroused the sinful passions not because the law was sinful. In fact, he's going to point out in a minute the problem was not with the law. The problem was with man and man not keeping the law. But what he's saying is the law aroused the sinful passions because you know that he would not have known sin except the law had said what sin was. Remember, if you back up in chapter 5, uh, back up in chapter 5 for a moment, uh, we saw this point in chapter 5, in, in verse uh, 13 and 14. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was the type of the one who was God. And so what he pointed out is, in order for there to be sin, well, let's back up for a second. Sin in and of itself is a transgression of law. Right. It's a transgression of law. If there is no law to transgress, then there can be no sin. Right? If sin is a transgression of law and there is no law, then there can be no such thing as sin. Now, the point in chapter 5 was there had to be some law from Adam to Moses because sin was in the world. But the point we don't understand and what he's saying and pointing out, the problem wasn't with the old law, and that's what aroused the sense of passions. The law was spiritual, but man is carnal, and when the law said, do not covet, and a man covets, he's violated the law. It's aroused the sense of passions because what he what he is being pulled to do, and that's the point he makes later on, we'll get to a really in a moment. About that I will to do, I do not, and that I will not do, that I do. That what he's saying is that the, that we would not know what sin is without the law. That's how sin allows the sinful uh, power of the law, allows the sinful factions in it. Because what we did was contrary to God's law. It wasn't a problem with the law, it was a problem with man who violated the law. Case in point verse 7, what, he wouldn't have known what covetousness was if the law had said, Thou shalt not. Covenant. So, uh, he wouldn't have known covetousness, but the law said that's going to covet. Now he knows that is wrong. It's sinful. Now, if you highlight your Bible, when you write in your Bible, you may want to highlight and write out beside verse uh, 7, key verse. Or if you take notes, you may want to note this is a key verse. Here's why verse 7 is very important to this text. We're fixing to get into a section here in a moment in which there is some controversy about. And that is about uh, the wretched man at the end of the chapter. Remember chapter 7. What is the title of chapter 7? It's on the top of the board. Romans 7 is about the law and sin. What law? Old law. That's the law we've been discussing. We mentioned the law, the, the law of faith and others, but we're talking about the old law here. How do I know we're talking about the old law? Paul said, I would not have known covetousness if the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Now that principle is found in the New Testament. There are a number of passages in the New Testament 
Now, we point out where it should not cut. In fact, we point out covetousness is idolatry. But that phrase, the law specifically saying, Thou shalt not covet, is from Exodus chapter 20 and the giving of the Ten Commandments. So, when we come here, and later on in the text, what other considerations what he's saying about being under the old law? So that's why verse 7 is important. Thou shalt not covet from Exodus chapter 20 and verse 17. Let's begin at verse 8 now. He pointed out the problem with the law of problems with man. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness, for apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law. When the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through uh, the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means it was sin producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. So we're missing some more points here in verse 14 beginning in a moment. But what he's pointing out in this text here is... Well, uh, this is a passage that we go to. Uh, I was lying once without the, uh, the commandment, when the, sin, the commandment came, sin arrived, and I died. He's talking about the age of accountability. I think what he's under consideration. Again, why not think he's using accountability and not talking about when the new law was given? Because the law that is under consideration is the law that said, Die by my cut. All before, long after the old law was given, many, many years later, but his point was, there came a time when he understood the right from wrong and understood he should not cause it, yet when he caused it, he's guilty of sin. And because he's guilty of sin, it produced a death in him. And, and so, because of that, he was, that, there was death on him, but it wasn't the law. The law is what's called holy. The commandment is holy and righteous and good. That's the law. The law is holy and righteous and good. So is that which is good brought down? Verse 13. It wasn't the, the good commandment. The, the, that law that was good that brought down. What brought death was sin. Now, how do we know what sin is? Because of the law. But it wasn't the law. The law's fault. In fact, that ties us into our next section here, beginning verse 14, and that is about the futility under the law. And he points out the law is spiritual, verse 14, but it's man that is carnal. Look at verse 14 to man. For we know the law is spiritual. The law is spiritual. But then he points out the latter half of 14, he goes on to 15, 23, and even at the last half of 25, and points out that we, man, is carnal. But I am a flesh, so don't understand. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. Now, if I do what I want, uh, what I, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand, for I rely in the law of God in my inner being. But as I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Look at the very end. Verse 25, but with my flesh I serve the law of Satan. Now I know there's a lot of very confusing language in verses 15 through 23. Uh, it's a tongue twister. And if you read through it, uh, you need your tongue twister real easily reading through it. And it's an often misused section of scripture. So, I'm going to take a second. We've got about not quite 10 minutes remaining. Uh, and talk about the misuse, and then I'm going to go through and disprove that, try to disprove that misuse here in the moment. So, uh, there, the, what he's pointing out here in this text is about the fact that the law is spiritual, but the problem is with man. That's what we've been saying. 
problem is with man because man is carnal in nature, fleshly in nature. And so, uh, even though there was something he willed to do, he didn't do it. Instead, what he did was he gave in to the flesh. We'll talk about that in a second. So, let's understand here. The, the language is, as I already said, kind of, kind of confusing. But I want to contrast the two men here in chapter 7 and chapter 6, which is going to tell us, first of all, that this is Paul. And then we're going to go to the second half. I'm going to go to the chart to help us see some more about it here in a second. So, a couple of things to consider. Number one, sometimes people argue that the man, particularly in verse 25, referred to as the wretched man, is Paul as a Christian. And even though he will not to do sin, he did sin. So I'm going to answer that question first. A wretched man that I am, verse 24 and 25. We'll read that real quick. Wretched man that I am who will deliver me from this body of death. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So that I myself serve the law of God in my mind. So here's the chart on this. <coughs> to contrast this, this man uh, with the man of chapter 6. Which will show us this isn't Paul as a Christian. But this is just Paul as an alien sinner. This is Paul for a bit of God. Let's see the chart in a moment. Chapter 7. Here's the man's description. The man is, verse 14, sold under sin. Look at verse 14 again. But I am of the flesh, sold under sin. Verse 20 now. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So whatever the consideration, describes, Paul describes himself as sold under sin and sin dwells in it. If that is Paul as a Christian... Let me tell you, Paul is a very sorry Christian. Because what he told him in chapter 6 was, go back to chapter 6 here, we're going to hit this really quickly. But look at what he said in chapter 6. He said in chapter 6, you died to sin. Verse 2, how can we who died to sin? He told him, verse 6, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be other way with. He told him in verse 12, not let uh, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. He told him in verse 13, Do not present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. And he pointed out in 16 and 17 that they are now slaves of righteousness and no longer slaves of sin. So, chapter 6, that's how he was a description. Chapter 7 is the description of the person under consideration as a wretched man. Can that be? Can Paul be a Christian in chapter seven, and that be the description as a Christian in chapter six, and, and would be very good according to chapter six? Uh, chapter six, he's got to be dead to sin. He can't be sinner in him. He can't use his, his members as instruments of unrighteousness. He has to be a slave of righteousness instead of sin. In chapter seven, the wretched man is Paul as a Christian. Then he's describing himself as soul under sin and sin dwells in him, and he is hypocrite for what he's told in chapter six. So we cannot be Paul as a Christian. Yes. I think the fourth word here is rain in your body. Something that rains in your body that's dominating. Okay? We have to realize the importance of Satan, the power that he has, but yet we are dead to that. So the more we study, the more we obey his will, the more we know his will, do it. That's pushing that stuff that's raining before to consider our body in the way. But my point with one of the bad guys gave a perfect down to the analogy. It's and we can't have that either. Because Paul here is telling. What I want to do, I don't do it. So here in himself, he can have a hard time with this and shows that he can get through through Christ. And we have to get through Christ. <laughs> You're right, you know, and, and it's important for us to understand that point about the fact that one uh, can uh, give in, but try not to let it rain or make a practice as first John three would say. I'm going to come back to that confusing language here. I've got a few minutes remaining. So Paul says, That I will not to do, that I do, that I will, that I will to do, I do not, that I will not to do, that I do. And you can read through all that again. And, and that tongue twisting passage there. But when you hear that language, you think, man, that sounds awful confusing. And it is confusing language. So Paul says, you know, that I hate, I do, and all this. Let's just simplify this. This is the point he's making. He does what he knows to be wrong and doesn't do what he knows to be wrong. 
That's the point that's being made. That when he lies, this man, the righteous man, that is, he's the alien sinner. And again, we're going to look at another chart on that in a minute. He dies, he, he knows right from wrong. Yet there are times he gives in to the flesh. Even though he knows what he needs to do, he may give in to the flesh. Uh, this reminds me of another passage in, in the book of Matthew when Jesus is there in the garden with uh, the apostles that he takes with him. And he tells them, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. For the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Are there times that people give in to fleshly desires even though they know what is right? Yes. Yes. So the point he's making is, is not that I could just I just couldn't help myself. In fact, that we kind of did chapter six. Because we told him chapter six was do not use your members as slaves of unrighteousness. Your, your members as slaves of or as instruments of unrighteousness. Do not let sin reign in your body. If we call this in chapter 10, then I couldn't help myself. I just did it. There was nothing I could do. That's what was determined. As some take the passage to say. Then when we call it in chapter 6, it, it is a new point because they, they can't control it if that's the case. Right? It, whatever he that is under discussion cannot violate the free moral agency of man. He's not saying I couldn't help myself. Rather, what he's saying is even though I knew what to do, there are times I gave in. He was human. Yes. He's human, and he, there were times he gave in to that to the flesh. Now, one more time we'll look at here, and then we'll read the last couple of verses. Is this the alien sinner or the Christian? Well, actually, let's read the last two verses again, because that will help us answer this question. The last couple of verses again here in chapter 7. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death. Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then I myself serve the law of God in my mind, when my flesh will serve the law of sin. So whatever the consideration, is this an alien sinner or a false Christian? Well, we always said, if it's him as a Christian, he's a very sorry Christian, is he just did everything he told those in chapter 6 not to do. But let's look at this again. Is it an alien sinner or a Christian? Well, whatever's under consideration is sold under sin. Whatever's under consideration is under the law, which means he can't be a Christian yet because the old law is what was in effect. Verse 14 the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. Not only that, verse 24, there's a desire for deliverance. Who will deliver me from this body of death? If it's Paul as a Christian, he's already obtained deliverance. Not, now, he's not going to heaven yet, but he's been delivered and free from his sin if he's already made the gospel. But he's crying out for deliverance. And then again, he points out in verse 20, sin dwells in him. So what Paul is discussing in 14 through the end of the chapter, the wretched man is Paul before he obeyed the gospel. That would be the description of those that we would refer to as the alien center, is what he's describing in that text. And again, that confusing language is not Paul saying, I couldn't help myself, but that sometimes I do. Again, we're going to look at this verse, the desire for deliverance. Yeah, I'm so rich man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? The answer is verse 25. It is through Christ Jesus our Lord. That leads us into the starting verse of chapter 8, where we will pick up there on Sunday morning. There is therefore now no condemnation in Christ. And so that's what leads to the discussion in chapter 8. As we wrap up this second subsection of, of the book of Romans, so Lord, we will pick up and start in chapter 8 on Sunday morning.